All right. What's going on, party peoples? Welcome. Uh, welcome to Cornerstone Church. Like I said, my name is Randy, one of the pastors here. Uh, Pastor Eric is, I don't know if it's technically a vacation, but he's, uh, he's just down in Jersey, I think, for the weekend, uh, doing his thing, visiting some family and stuff. You got me today. So as a, before I get it started, I'd like, to, I'd like to take a little poll of the people, if that's possible. A little, a little poll. Can we, uh, by show of hands, I'd be curious to see, how many people in here grew up in church? Would say that they consider that they grew up in church. Yeah, yeah, my wife right there, she's one of them, right? How many, how many would say, I did not grow up in church? In fact, I don't know what I'm doing here right now. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, so all kinds, right? All kinds, all kinds of people up in here. Uh, like I said, my wife, my wife was a pastor kid growing up in Columbia, and she had this whole uh, complete opposite experience than what I had growing up, which I was not in church. I had no idea what church was about. I had a lot of like preconceptions of what church was about. But she was uh, having, having the time of her life growing up as a pastor kid. She was a worship leader. She was enjoying youth group and mission trips. Uh, this, this, I'm going to brag on you a little bit, babe. But she, at about, uh, I don't know, like 16 or 17 years old in Colombia, Bogota, the city, um, if you're putting two and two together, actually, Pastor Eric's wife is also from Bogota, Colombia. They did not know each other before we came here for the first time. So that was really weird. Uh, and we thought like God was maybe doing something. And that's kind of how I ended up on this stage. But uh, she grew up in Bogota and about 16, 17 years old. Uh, God put it on her heart as a pastor kid to start a foundation uh, reaching out in her city to, to at-risk young kids. And I'm talking like, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And, and in the city there, it's like, that's, when you say like at-risk or, or whatever, it's like they're very much at-risk. It's super poor. And so God used her to, to start this foundation. And, and, and eventually, like, I think a couple hundred kids were coming at a time on a Sunday, and they were coming and they were getting, they were getting fed. They were getting some resources. They were learning the scripture. They were all singing together and doing all these like cute little Jesus plays and stuff. And it was really an awesome thing in that neighborhood in that time. And God really used my wife who grew up in church. That was her church experience. Me, I had the complete opposite experience. I was way too cool to do anything in my own eyes, right? I didn't want to do nothing. I wanted to, if I can be honest, I wanted to kind of sit around and smoke pot every day and, uh, and, and judge everybody else and think I was smarter than everybody else. In fact, like from the outside looking in, like an outsider to the church looking in, I was like, I want absolutely nothing to do with church. I feel like church is, at the time, I felt like church was, full of a bunch of hypocrites, I'm sorry, uh, and, and fairy tale believers. People who believed in this big, you know, I don't know, spaghetti monster in the sky or whatever, or some old man sitting on a cloud with a big, long, white beard who's like disapproving of everything that I do. That was my preconception of church. It was one of those things where... Um, I would have a joke, right? Because I, I would be invited, like, every once in a while, so thank you so much. Uh, let's get it for Sam. Great job, Sam. Woo! Look at that guy. Wow. Love that guy. <laughs> Sorry. It's like I'm never bringing you water again, ever. <laughs> so I would have a joke because I would get invited sometimes to, to church. You know, it just happened, right? Uh, and they would invite me, and I'm, you know, 16 years old or something, 17 years old. And, and my, my joke would be like, oh, even if I wanted to set foot in church, even if I wanted to go in church, I can't. Because once I step into that front doorway, I'm going to burst into flames. <laughs> I'm just too bad for church, right? I'm just too, I'm too bad for church. And, and on one hand, it was like a joke, like I'm too bad of a dude to go to church. But on the inside, really, there was a little bit something else too. It was like, I was like, oh, I think I'm too messed up to go to church, I think, I think I fall way too short of some of the requirements to be a part of that club. I don't dress a certain way. I don't act a certain way. I don't speak a certain way. I don't even, I didn't know what hallelujah meant. In fact, I'm still not sure I know what hallelujah means. I know it's good though. I didn't vote a certain way. Maybe I was doing too many extracurricular activities, if you know what I mean. And I just felt like there was no way that they would accept me in any church that I set foot in. And unfortunately, this kind of idea is kind of common out there in the world. I used to work in construction. 
And there's a lot of tough guys that work in construction, right? So sometimes, uh, I mean, I wasn't one of them, but there was tough guys that I worked with. And they would, uh, we'd have conversations every once in a while, and it would veer to things like God and religion, because it, it happens across the board, right? Pretty much anywhere you go, at some point in time, there's a chance you're going to hear conversations about God and about eternity. The Bible says that God has put eternity into the hearts of men. Everybody wonders about what's going to happen next, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, right? Everybody has kind of crossed that path. And I remember hearing guys and talking to guys about church, even in the construction trades, and they would say the same thing that I used to say when I was like 16, 17 years old. They'd say, oh, there's no way I can go into church because the second I step foot in a church, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to burst into flames. And it's sad, but it's true that people have that kind of a, a hang-up. To them, they feel like church is a place with a big neon sign over it saying, you're not welcome here. You're an outsider, and you don't belong here. Unfortunately, and let's be honest, unfortunately, sometimes churches can give people that message. Sometimes churches can give people that message, whether they mean to or not. I was talking to a, a sweet woman recently. I was out there at the Welcome Center, and it's interesting because, because the, the story that she was telling me, I, I hear often as a pastor, uh, she, she grew up in church, but she walked away from it for many years. And it was like her first step back in after many years of being away when I talked to her at the Welcome Center. And she told me this super sad story, a very impactful story about how she grew up in the church and she was told that she needed to do things a certain way or God wasn't going to like her. God's not going to want anything to do with her. And so she did the best that she could to follow all the rules and the regulations and all these things that the church was putting on her. The way you got to dress, the way you got to act, the way that you spend your money, the person that you date, the person that you marry. And the church was honestly legalistic, if you know that word, and abusive. I'm sure you know that word abusive. This is Bob. We think he's the one for you. You got to marry this guy. You should marry this guy. God wants you to marry this guy. Bob. And Bob's like a creep. <laughs> Sorry to all the Bobs in the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know a couple of them. They're going to talk to me afterwards. I know they are. <laughs> But unfortunately, there's plenty of churches out there, tr plenty of man-made religious institutions, let's call them, that they say that you can't have a relationship with God until you wear what they want you to wear and do what they want you to do and say what they want you to say. And if you can't toe the line, well, then you're rebellious and God is probably mad at you. And when you come into that church, if you're still trying to come into that church and people know that you're in rebellion, you didn't marry Bob. You didn't want to cover your ankles, ladies. Well, then you're in rebellion and the people are going to tisk tisk you. They'll look you up and down and say, you don't belong here. You're an outsider. And heaven forbid that, a, that, a, that an exposed female ankle is ever seen because we all know that the boys can't control themselves if they see an ankle, baby. And, I'm, and I make light of that, but that's, that's actually true in some places. It's like, that's one of the laws. I would show you my ankle, but it is hairy and disgusting. And I probably need to get it looked at. Christ himself back in his day, he got after his version of the church world, of the church leaders of his day. When he claimed this about the church leaders, uh, the, excuse me, the temple leaders, Matthew 23, 4, he says, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. That is quite the indictment. Imagine Jesus, I, that's scared. that stuff scares me. When I read scripture and it's talking about religious leaders and I'm like, oh yeah, I kind of am one, oh my gosh. That's scary. 
crushing people with unbearable religious demands. These people in Jesus' day had turned what should have been a vibrant relationship with a living God into a dead religion that was just hyper-focused on turning scripture into a matter of rule after rule after rule. It's simply do's and don'ts, and the don'ts are super long, and if you do any of those don'ts, you're done. God wants nothing to do with you. Jesus was not thrilled with these guys at all. As we see in verses 13 and 14 of the same chapter, he says, woe to you. I don't know if you've ever used the word woe in that way before. Woe to you. Pharisees and teachers of the law, the the religious leaders of the day. He says, you hypocrites, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And you yourselves don't enter in, nor do you let those enter in who are trying to. Jesus had a bone to pick with the religious leaders of his day. And we're going to see why in just a few moments here. Last week, Pastor Eric showed this slide of a sign that was hung outside of the original temple, the the Jewish temple, at least the temple in Jesus' day. Before you entered into that temple where the presence of God was, that was supposed to be the house of God. Before you could enter in, there was a sign that you had to cross, a boundary that you had to go through. And that sign right there that you see, this is actually what they found in archaeological digs. Same sign. It was a warning to the outsiders. And it said, if you are not one of us, if you are a Gentile and not a Jew, be warned because if you as an outsider cross this boundary into the house of God, it will be your head. You're not welcome here. You're not like us. You weren't born like us. You don't talk like us. You don't look like us. And there was a great animosity as Pastor Eric was preaching last week, a great animosity between the Jews and everybody else, which they call the Gentiles. You are not welcome here. Now, the irony is that the temple, which had originally been intended for good, had become the headquarters for a corrupt man-made system. They called it God's house, you see. But in reality, it had become anything but Jesus had some famous encounters in that temple for sure. One of, the, one of the most famous stories that you might have heard of is when he goes in and he flips the tables, right? Jesus goes into that temple. Jesus is the son of God, keep in mind, right? He goes into what's supposed to be his father's house, the temple, the house of God. And he goes in there and what he sees disgusts him so badly. And they're going so opposite of what God desired and intended that he goes in there and flips the temple. Uh, Excuse me, flips the tables. Mark 11 On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. The reason they were selling doves, I want you to follow this, is because doves were a sacrifice for sin. And what they would do is they would sell these different animals because if you were a sinner, you had to buy them and sacrifice them to be able to kind of get close and back in relationship with God. But actually, the more sin the people did, the better for business it was for the people that were selling those animals. It was a complete corrupt system. And Jesus, it says, would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. One of the other gospels says that he created a little whip and he drove them out after flipping the tables with all the money on it. He was furious. And in his anger, he did not sin. It was zeal. And he taught them as he did it. He said, is it not written in your very own scriptures? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you guys have turned it into a den of thieves and robbers. That's crazy. It's interesting because the next line, 
you're going to kind of see like what germinated what they wanted to do with Jesus. It says that the leaders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they heard this and they began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. You see, he was cutting straight to the heart of a false religious system. And what was supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations, maybe a light for the Gentiles to see the goodness of God and hear the praises and the joy of his people. What was intended for good had actually become a big, corrupt, money-making scheme designed to keep specific people in power. That doesn't sound like something that we would do today, right? Corruption, love of money, power, authority, control. We would never do that in this modern... No, actually, humans do that all the time. The heart of man is always bent on certain things on destruction even, if it's not for the grace of God. Money, corruption, power, control. Have things really changed? Because I'm going to be honest with you, it seems like every couple months I see an article or somebody sends me an article about some other church somewhere that is doing one of these things and got busted. Money, power, control, scandal, sex, weird stuff. Right? Can I say that in church? Is that okay? Do I need to leave? Like, I'll go home. Like, I crossed the line or something. It's true. It's true. And when I hear someone like that lady who came up to the Welcome Center, and and someone actually had a conversation with last night even, and they're telling me their story of where they come from and these wounds that they have taken in church. And the difficulty, man, I've taken wounds in church too. And the difficulty sometimes is to separate it out and be like, even though you say you're representing Jesus doesn't mean that Jesus is the one abusing me. Not everyone who merely looks the part is a child of God. Jesus really freaked these guys out because they were like, oh, This is the temple. This is the house of God. God is our father. And you got to kind of do what we say. And Jesus said, God is your father. Your father is actually the devil. Man, they were blown back. (laughs) How dare this man talk to us like that? Doesn't he know who we are? Doesn't he know that I can pray super fancy and preach an amazing word? And Jesus is like, that's for show. That's for you. That's for you. Sometimes the danger with somebody up on stage is that you can preach. You can be talented, man. You can preach an amazing fire sermon and people come up to you like, wow, God used you so much, et cetera, et cetera. But in the meantime, in my heart, I'm thinking, look at me, I'm awesome. (laughs) I know how to use my voice, use inflection, use pregnant pauses to draw people in if their minds are slipping a little bit and wandering. I know how to come down and come up. I know how to do those things. So if I'm talented, and maybe I'm not, but if I am talented, I need to be completely submitted to Jesus Christ because it's not always what it looks like on the surface, amen? He told the religious leaders who looked the part, your father's the devil, And he left us with a warning too. He said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord. Have you heard that before? Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. Not everyone who says they're for Jesus is really representing Jesus. A lot of people have done a lot of wicked things in the name of Jesus. Ugh. I told you before, I was in a homeless program, right, for young adults. And there was, this is in uh, Los Angeles at the time, and there was another kind of smaller program, homeless program for, like, young adults, too. And it was, like, in the same town, basically. It was maybe about 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from where we were. We weren't affiliated with them, but I had a buddy in that program. And uh, (laughs) he was a great guy. He was really cool. Whenever I got to see him, I was super excited to see him and stuff. And after some years of me... God getting my life together in this program and what I thought God working on him in that program. 
it turned out that the guy who was leading his program was a terrible, horrible abuser. And he abused all the people that were in his program in the name of Jesus. And he manipulated them and made them think that they needed to do certain things because the man of God had told them to do those things. And if you didn't do those things, you're an outsider. So baby, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to be there in the kingdom. Just like not everybody who looks the part is the real deal. Not every building called a temple or a church is a good or true representation of God. Isaiah 66, Old Testament says this. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. How are you going to build a temple that contains me? Right? Where's my resting place going to be? I built the heavens and the earth. I'm not going to be contained by a building with four walls. I'm too big for that. Paul echoes that in Acts 17. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. I talked about this a little bit last time that I preached. You might remember a little bit, but it's not like God is in here hanging out lonely throughout the week and just waiting for Sunday when people come visit him. God is too big for that. He's not hanging out and limited to a building. You can't cage God. So we see that from Jesus' time, even back then, even the ones who were supposedly close to God, right? The keepers of the house of the Lord, the ones who guarded the presence of God, supposedly, even those guys, even they, in reality, were far, far away from God of heaven and earth. They were misrepresenting them, misrepresenting God. And we see that those people had something in common with the Gentiles, the outsiders, the ones that they looked down their noses at. They had something very much so in common with all those outsiders because really they, right along with the Gentiles, were completely missing the mark when it came to God. They thought you could kind of build your own stairway to heaven and just follow the rules and follow the rules and follow the rules. And because it was a corrupt system, they were accused also by Jesus of putting and binding heavy loads to the people's backs and taking what the Bible said and then adding more and more and more to it and not helping the people with it all and just saddling them with this burden. So God himself to them became a burden they couldn't bear. Has anyone felt like that? Man, thank God for the good news. Thank God for the good news. I'm going somewhere here. I'm going somewhere with this. We're not going to just poke at the, the church and the leaders. The good thing is that God shut everyone out. Everyone was falling short. Everyone was trapped in disobedience. Even the ones that said they knew God were misrepresenting God. So then God had to do something about it. Romans 3, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without having to, have, having to keep all those requirements of the law. It says that was even promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. I don't know if anybody fishes, right? I've been fishing. I'm old, and I've only been fishing, like, for the first times in my life recently. I had a buddy who was like, you got to come out and fly fish. And I was like, I don't know, man. I went out there. It was awesome. I had the time of my life. It was amazing. In fishing, right, you catch the fish first, and then you clean it, right? That makes sense. You don't clean the fish first and then catch it. And what this is saying here is that we are made right. We come into God's kingdom and presence, not because we're clean first and then we can come in because we're worthy now. 
And that's the problem is sometimes we portray that to the outsiders and say, oh, if you just weren't gay, baby, then you could come into our kingdom. You could come into God's house. Oh, if you just weren't doing this and you just weren't drinking last night. Oh, if you were just more patient and kinder. Oh, if you just did all these things, then you could come in. And Jesus is saying it's not about building the stairway to heaven. It's about him flinging the doors open and coming down for us. And meeting us where we're at. The danger when we start looking at people's sin before allowing them in, in a way, as we're saying that, it's more important how you act than who you have in your heart. It's more important what you look like on the outside than what's going on on the inside. It goes on. We are made right with God. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For every single one of us has sinned and was bound up, trapped by sin. And it's only Jesus Christ that can rescue us. Nobody is better than anybody else. It is God who makes us acceptable. And it's only by his grace and mercy Verse 24 says, God in his grace freely made us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Am I advocating for lawlessness? Oh, it doesn't matter what you do. Sin is awesome. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Well, I'm saying you got to catch the fish before you clean the fish. You got to catch the fish before you clean the fish. And this applies to the high and the low. Those who were near to God and those who were far. All were sinners. All missed the mark. All were desperately in need of the mercy and grace of God. And that brings us right back full circle to what Pastor Eric was talking about last week in Ephesians. Ephesians 2.17 Ephesians 2.17 says this, He came and preached peace to those of you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him both the Jew and the non-Jew, for through him both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. In Christ, you are no longer an outsider. But you have been made members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets who gave their lives before us and wrote down in this book and gave their testimony to us throughout the generations. We have been built on that foundation with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. That chief cornerstone. And when the religious leaders of the day rejected him and put him to death because he was a threat to their religious, corrupt, man-made system, that was a fulfillment of prophecy straight from the Psalms. It says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Ephesians 2 goes on. In him, the whole building is joined together. Are we talking about a physical building anymore? Are we talking about a bunch of, like, physical bricks and, like, wood and vinyl or whatever this is and walls? Are we talking about this right now? We're not, because even that physical temple from back in the day, great as it was, was merely a symbol and a foreshadowing of a greater spiritual truth. And that greater spiritual truth is this. First Peter 2.4, 
I'm sorry, Ephesians 2.21. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Do you hear that? You, as a believer, if you are a believer, have been made into what Peter calls a living stone. A living stone in a spiritual temple of God. Because nothing on earth could ever, with walls, enclose God. He would never live in a physical house because he created heaven and earth. But he chooses to live in you and me as believers. And calls us living stones. So that together with these apostles and prophets and writers and believers that have gone before us. With Jesus as the most integral part of that foundation. We're being built together into a spiritual temple. Where God's presence dwells. We're called. We're called by him. We're knit together by him. The Bible says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Maybe something we don't understand with our minds all the time, but it doesn't make it any less true. First Peter 2 says this, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God through Jesus. And when we hear that we're supposed to be like a priesthood, if I was sitting over there and I heard this message before, I'd be like, me, a priest? I, I don't think so. But God is saying and calling us and saying that each one of us as a living stone in his temple has access to the Father. We don't need a middle man to bring us to God. We only need Jesus Christ. And if it says that we're supposed to be a holy priesthood, bringing our spiritual sacrifices, what in the world could that mean? What offering could me, who's suddenly finding myself a priest or something, what kind of offering, what kind of offering could I bring? What kind of sacrifice could I bring to the king of heaven and earth? Well, that spiritual sacrifice is our lives. As a priest, a priesthood, We are supposed to offer our lives before the Lord, our whole lives. And I know in myself that I'm a mess. And I know in myself that I struggle with all kinds of things, as I know people in here struggle. I know very well a lot of my faults, maybe not all of them, but a lot of my faults. And I go before the Lord and I still, I give him my life. And all the hang-ups that come with it, I got to give him my life. I got to give him my pride. I gotta give him my anger, my impatience. I gotta give him my unbelief. I gotta give him my anxiety, my depression, the different things that I deal with. I gotta get on my knees and give it to the Lord Jesus Christ and offer my life as a sacrifice and offering to him, knowing, knowing that it's not good enough unless God makes it good enough. And when we find our knees in surrender as when he comes and scoops us up and in his grace makes that acceptable to him. Do you hear what I'm saying? When I was first a a Christian, I, I really struggled I really struggled for years, actually. This was something that took a long time for me to kind of kind of figure out a little bit. It was that it was that I wanted to be the good Christian, right? I wanted to be, I had enough of the world. I wanted to be the good Christian guy. And I wanted to stop doing this and stop doing that. And I wanted to be more like this and more like that. But it seemed like the more I tried to stop doing things, the more I did them. 
And that'll drive you crazy if you let it. Because I became obsessed with trying to stop doing this. I gotta stop being like this. I gotta stop doing that. I gotta stop drinking. I gotta stop doing And I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying. I'm getting worse and I'm getting worse and I'm getting worse. And I'm finding myself right back on my knees again. And I read Galatians 5. And it says the Holy Spirit produces. And I'm going to read that again because it doesn't say Randy produces in his flesh. It says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy and patience and peace and kindness and goodness and self-control. All the stuff that I, I couldn't produce in myself. And I would try. I, I would try before I understood it. I would try and I'd be like, all right, all right, branch, produce for me some fruit. <laughs> I need some joy. <laughs> I need some peace. I need some patience. I need some self-control. And it wasn't happening for me because I was thinking I could do it myself. But that scripture says the Holy Spirit produces it. And it was only when I started to understand that all these hangups that I had, and I still have some hangups, all these hangups, if I was like a tree and I was expecting all this fruit, I was spending all my time trying to clip this stuff off of me, like pruning a tree. I just want to have more fruit. I want to get rid of this, and I want to get rid of that, and I want to get rid of this. And I'd cut those little branches off, and it seemed like they'd always grow back stronger and bigger. And then I realized that God is so bright and his love is so white hot that the more I sought him, the more I found him. And the more time that I spent with him, the more that he would burn those things off of me because those things couldn't stand in the presence of a holy God. And he started to do a work in my life where I thought there was no way. And I say it all the time, but he took me from the street and brought me and brought me on. And I, I, there's just some things that I like find unacceptable in life. And one of them is when people think that they're too messed up for God to, to work with. Too messed up for God to change. Done too many things. Been too broken. It's like, man, God's God's specialty. If you're feeling too broken, you're right at home. You're right at home. You see, what a physical building couldn't accomplish and can never accomplish, God has accomplished in us. He's made our bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit. And each of us, and when we think about it, each of us with our different backgrounds, our different places that we come from, our different places that our families come from, I mean, look around the room. There's people from all over, probably from every continent on earth or who families are from every continent on earth. And God has taken us all, taken us all and done the impossible and united us into one body, into one spiritual temple, if you will, where God dwells inside of us. And when we pray, we do indeed become a house of prayer for the nations. Because in Christ, in his body, all nations are present. He has done what only he could do. And when we sing that song that like, open up the doors and let the music play, let them streets resound with singing, right? Songs of joy and songs of hope. The idea that we're going to dance upon injustice because it doesn't belong. And if that's around, then I'm not doing my job as a child of God. I am concerned with suffering. I want people to see joy and have hope. Throw those doors open and let them hear not the music from the stage, but the music from our lives and the testimony of God's goodness to us. Can you believe that today? Now, as we end, this is, this is the first Sunday of the month where we always do communion on the first Sunday of the month. 
And if anyone uh, doesn't have, maybe we can get the ushers over here. Yes, please. Thank you. If anyone needs um, those elements there, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand and, and uh, an usher will bring them over to you. I have, as silly as it sounds, I have like instructions for how to open these a little bit because I have almost spilled these all over myself. <laughs> There's like a, it's like a, this two lid deal. It's like two in one kind of a thing. So you got to kind of pull off that top lid to open up that bread there. That wafer. From one bread, from one bread symbolizing his body, from one body of Christ to our many bodies. And from one cup, his blood given for all nations, all who would receive him. Before we take this, if you're holding on to unforgiveness, I just, I just beg you, let it go. Trust that God is good. Trust his mercy endures forever. Trust that God is going to deal with whatever situation and whatever person may have wronged you. It's better that God is judge. It's better that God is in control. Release that unforgiveness now in the name of Jesus. Let it go. And if you're struggling, if you're entangled in sin, if you feel like it's a, a part of you, like it's almost who you are. I'm just an alcoholic. I'm never going to change. I'm just an adulterer. I'm never going to change. That you would just take a moment and just whisper to God, maybe under your breath and say, Lord, I surrender. Help me. Do what only you can do. Invite him in. Surrender your life. Jesus was at a table with his disciples and they call it the Last Supper. And as you know, many of you know, those disciples were unqualified. They were, they were considered, some of them were considered losers, outsiders, dirty fishermen. People were shocked at one point in time when they heard them and saw them moving in power because they're like, aren't these guys just losers? And God had a table full of outsiders, chose the outsiders to come and be near to him. A bunch of weak people in their weakness, God in turn made strong. And at that table on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And it says that when he had given thanks, he broke that bread. And he said, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take that body, that symbol of Christ's body right now in the name of Jesus. And in the same way, the scripture says, after supper, he took the cup He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new agreement between God and man. It represents his blood. Shed for the forgiveness of sins. For yours and for mine. If we truly receive him now in our hearts. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take that cup now. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we believe he's coming. Father, just thank you today. Thank you for your amazing grace, Lord. Thank you that you're not a God of lawlessness, but you're a God of order. 
but you're also reachable and approachable, Lord. That your Holy Spirit convicts of sin and you don't want us to be tangled up in it. Lord, we repent in the name of Jesus of all the things that take us away from you, whatever it is. We give everything to you, right down to our lives, our identities, our choices, all these things we give to you in the name of Jesus. We lay it at your feet, God. That's our offering to you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your grace that receives outsiders like us and makes us part of your family. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, God. Amen.